Excellent. All right. So um, the purpose of the series that we're starting in Acts, we've studied Acts before, a few years ago as a church, but we want to look at Acts, especially in light of the early church and how the church started, because we essentially are, in a way, starting again. We're, as we're starting to come to church, uh, we want to be reminded of what church is and why we're doing this. And we're going to look this Sunday uh, at the first church community and what marked out the first church community. But as you look through Acts, it doesn't take you long to realize that uh, the Holy Spirit plays a huge role in the early church. The early church would not have functioned without the Holy Spirit. And so this session, this Bible study, our first one, is to just talk about the Holy Spirit and get our mind right about the Holy Spirit and His role in the lives of of believers. And I think it's a hugely important topic and something that, especially in more conservative denominations, is underplayed and underregarded the Holy Spirit. I read a book by Francis Chan um, about the Holy Spirit, and it was called The Forgotten God, which is quite a, um, uh, quite a title. Basically, he's saying that to a large extent, we focus a lot on the Father, we focus a lot on Jesus Christ, but we don't tend to focus a lot on the Holy Spirit. And so that's what hopefully this session will start to undo. Um, and so we're going to start by looking together at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts. As you know, Acts is essentially part two of Luke, written by Luke as well. Uh, and it's, it's his second volume, Acts is. But we're going to read how Luke ends and how Acts starts. And I'm going to ask for each of these readings for a volunteer to read it for us. Uh, it'll be nice if we all have a chance to partake and interact. Um, so let's start with Luke 24. Will you turn there with me? And for those listening to the recording, you might not be, be able to hear the reader, uh, but you can just read these at home in your Bibles. So Luke 24, from verse 36 to the end of the book, uh, verse 36 to 53. Who wants to read that for us? All right, Sylvia, nice and loud. You're right from the back there. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sylvia, for reading that. Okay, so 
Right here, we've got to start, um, because this is really where we, we start learning about the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, Jesus has said a lot of things already in the Gospels about the Holy Spirit, but uh, this is essentially the beginning of Acts, and there's a bit of an overlap. We're going to read the beginning of Acts as well, and the Ascension. But what do we learn right away in this passage about the Holy Spirit? There's already something we can learn about the Holy Spirit. Anyone? Where does Jesus talk about the Holy Spirit here? Okay. Okay, how do we know that he's talking about the Holy Spirit? Well, I mean... Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he doesn't he, so he doesn't explicitly mention the spirit here, but it's when we read Acts and that's why we've got to read Acts as well that we see what he means. So at the end of Luke it's almost left as a bit of a tentative, oh, what is the promise of God? Um so if we turn now to Luke and pick up the story, then we we see what what happens. So let's do that. I mean to Acts Let's read the beginning of Acts again. And after we've read that, we're going to look at both of these passages, the end of Luke, beginning of Acts, and we're going to pick out of them what we learn about the Holy Spirit. Because we actually learn a whole lot about the Holy Spirit from these verses already. Okay, so can somebody else read the first eight verses of Acts for us? All right, Tammy, thanks. Once you've got your mask off. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we start to see he explicitly mentions that the thing that he was talking about at the end of Luke is the Holy Spirit. And so we can now go back to Luke, but keep your finger in Acts. John is kind of in the way. Um, John's a great gospel, but the one thing it's got against it is that it, um, it gets in the way of Luke and Acts when you're trying to read it as one continuing narrative. But... Um, what do we learn from these two passages we've just read about the Holy Spirit? Scan over them again. Scan over the one at the end of Luke. Scan over the one at the beginning of Acts. And just as you come across anything that we can learn about the Holy Spirit, um, let us know. The Holy Spirit is a promise from God. Okay, let's pause there. Okay, now we're going to look at the rest of the things. But for each of them, let's spend some time thinking about it. So what does it mean that the Holy Spirit is God's promise? Which is something we see in both passages, don't we? Jesus says, I'm sending you what my father promised in Luke and in Acts. Uh, where does he talk about God's promise? Verse 8, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come. Yeah, but where? He also mentions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned there. That's another thing we learn about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the father's promise, verse 4. Not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Father's promise, which is quite significant. Now, what does it mean that the Holy Spirit is the Father's promise? Okay. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Now, you'd think, you're right, uh, John is explicit when it comes to talking about the Holy Spirit, especially in the latter half when Jesus instructs his disciples before he's crucified. But if this is true, what we're reading here, then the Old Testament should also be quite explicit about the Holy Spirit, because apparently it's what God promised. Where did he promise it? He promised it in the Old Testament. So if we really want to learn about the Holy Spirit, we don't start in Acts. We start in the Old Testament, right? So let's do that. Let's go back to the Old Testament and see what the Old Testament says about the Holy Spirit. Now, actually, we meet the Spirit technically on the first page of the Bible in Genesis 1, where God's Spirit was hovering over the waters. Remember that in creation? But let's skip forward a bit to Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah 32. Now, it's a long-ish reading. Uh, Not all the readings we're doing tonight are going to be this long. But I do want you to get a taste of where the Holy Spirit fits into the Old Testament. And the effect of God's Spirit and what He promises. So, if Jesus says the Holy Spirit has been promised by God, let's read one of those promises. Um, Dylan, can you read... Isaiah 32 for us, the whole chapter. Thanks. All right, so what does God promise about the Holy Spirit here in Isaiah 32? What's the situation here, and what difference does the Holy Spirit make? Okay, so we see verse 15 mentioned, mentions the Holy Spirit, yeah? Change, exactly. So we see... That verse, 15, flips everything around, doesn't it? What was before and what is after the Spirit comes. (laughs) The poor complacent woman. So the king will come 
right at the beginning we read that first one um, and then the spirit will be poured out okay so that the two are going to happen around the same time yeah <laughs> yeah. What does that remind us of, by the way? That eyes seeing and ears hearing? Anyone? The, the parables. The parable of the sower. Jesus talks in those terms. And he says his teaching is going to cause those with eyes to see to see more and ears to hear to hear more. But those without seeing and hearing aren't, are going to hear and see less. It's going to be part of judgment. Yeah, uh, essentially. Yeah, so we'll see that later. Uh, that That's another aspect about the Spirit that we learn. Um, and part of God's promise is that the Spirit's going to bring illumination, understanding. But what here f physically, rather than just what He's going to do in our minds, what is He going to do in the world, <laughs> according to this chapter? Going to flip what? Okay, but he, there's more than just the people changing here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's not just an inner spiritual change. You know, we mustn't think in this dualistic spiritual versus physical. That's, that's not how the Bible talks about things. This Holy Spirit is going to make physical changes to this world, uh, according to Isaiah 32. So the desert becomes an orchard. The orchard becomes a forest. <laughs> There's this abundant growth and good creation. Now, what does this remind us about? what the Spirit's already done, or the Spirit's work in, in Genesis. What does the Spirit do in Genesis? Thank you, yes, exactly. The Spirit is the one hovering over the chaos and the darkness, and He brings order and life and light to darkness and chaos and death. And so that's the purpose right from the beginning of God's Spirit. God the Father decrees what's going to happen. God the Spirit goes and then makes it happen and infuses dead and chaotic darkness with life and order and here we see even after the fall which brings disorder and chaos back into the world the spirit has been planned right from the come and convert Dylan, can you just check the receiver there? Oh, wait, I'm back. There you go. Maybe I walked too far away from it. No? Still there? Okay. Yeah? <laughs> it's a nice illustration. Has anybody seen that picture of the Tevatoskloof Dam like three years ago versus what it is now? Well, that's Isaiah 32. Okay, that, that, it, it, this, and it's the spirit that's going to cause not just the Tevatis Kluf Dam to go from curse to blessing, but the whole world to go from curse to blessing. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Yeah, Desiree? Absolutely, yeah. Because the reason the land is cursed is because of the curse. It's because of Genesis 3. That's where we read about the land being messed up. And here the land itself is being renewed, which means that the curse of Genesis 3 is going to be undone by the work of the Spirit, doing what he did in Genesis 1. Does that make sense? So Genesis 1, the Spirit brought order and life and goodness and flourishing and, and everything good to this world by God's decree. We messed it up because of sin. And then God doesn't go, oh, well, enjoy a messed up world, everyone. I'm, I'm, I've had enough of you. Right from the beginning, he's still got a plan to send his spirit again to undo the chaos again and to bring order and undo the curse, essentially. And here we read that 
very explicitly in Isaiah 32. But it's only later on when we get to Jesus and what happens in Acts that we see how the Holy Spirit is going to bring this slow but sure undoing of the curse around. And so when we read about the Holy Spirit in Acts, this is what he's doing. He's doing what God promised he would do in Isaiah 32. It's important to see that in the context of what was promised. It's not like God changed his mind and said, you know what, I want the Spirit to do something else than what I said he'd do in the Old Testament. This is his mission. And it's still his mission today. Any questions on that? Dylan? Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Who's the us then? But who's his people? Okay. Who is his people in the Old Testament? Israel. Okay. Yeah. So it's Israel and it's still Israel, but not national Israel. It's the Israel, which is the church. Those who, Israel is essentially those who serve the King of Israel, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so Israel today aren't the Jews sitting in Tel Aviv and yes, yes, there's, of course they are. And they always have been. But today, the, the ethnic Jews who are following the Messiah are outnumbered by the Gentiles who are actually part of Israel following Messiah. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that um, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on Israel. Uh, but what happens is that it, the Israel that we see in the New Testament is much bigger and more vast than the Israel was in the, in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's something we also need to pick up, that there's this empowerment that was exclusive to a very select group of people. And it wasn't only the prophets and the kings. Interestingly, it was also the interior designers of the temple. We'll get there in a second. Bezalel and a few others. Um, But... The difference now is that, yeah, you're right. Even in the Old Testament, God promised that he would be poured out on a much more vast scale than the select few that experienced the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. In the Old Testament, yeah. Yeah, on on those people. Yeah. I mean, to, an, to a certain extent, we should be praying that prayer of, of Psalm 51 as well. Uh, you know, the, the Hebrews warns us against those, uh, if you've tasted the Holy Spirit, then if you fall away, you can't come back. That's the warning in Hebrews, which implies that there are people who experience the Holy Spirit to a certain extent and then fall away and lose the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit is taken from them because of their disobedience. Anyway, that's, a, th- th- that's another discussion. For now, we just want to learn more about the Holy Spirit. We see that He's already promised right from the Old Testament to do the very thing He's always been doing right from the beginning of creation. Let's turn back to Luke and Acts and see what else we learn from it. See, that's just one thing we pick up about the Holy Spirit. We pull that thread and it starts to unravel all the way through the Old Testament. That's the beautiful thing about the Bible, isn't it? You just you pull one thread, you start to follow cross-references and things, and the picture just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But we've only got like another half hour together, so we have to go much quicker than I'd like to. That's just the way of things. Okay, what else do we learn? We learned that he was promised. What else do we learn from these passages in Acts and Luke? He empowers. Thank you. Where do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So, one verse eight: you will receive power. Um, Luke twenty four forty nine: I'm sending what my father promised. Stay in the city until you are empowered from high. Okay. So he gives you power. What does that mean? Does he make your biceps bigger? 
Um, does he make you stronger? Uh, like the Hulk, when you get the Holy Spirit, do you turn all big and green? No. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit gives power? Okay. So, why do we need power to be witnesses? Can't we just be witnesses without power? Sorry? Okay, but why do we need power for... I mean, I, I love my wife. Why do I need to be empowered to love? That's, I mean, that's one thing we see in the narrative of the church, don't we? Before the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they were cowering and scared, and Peter denied Jesus, and the servant girl by the fire scared him so much, and then you've got Mark running away naked, probably Mark, You've got this, this really pathetic bunch of people. After the Pentecost, yo, what a difference. These 12 men change the world. Within three centuries, the whole Roman Empire is Christian because of their witness. And they, all but one, end up bravely giving their life. This is a night and day change. So that's one way the Holy Spirit empowers them, by giving them courage that they didn't have before. How else does the Holy Spirit empower? Okay, he empowers with understanding. Okay, wisdom. But how is the how are these things powerful? What does it mean to have power? What does power mean? <laughs> yeah, does it? Okay, to have something that other people don't have okay what else does power mean Uh, I don't know if power means spirituality to most people strength thank you we're talking about being strong being able to do things that you couldn't do if you didn't have the strength right lifting um, five bags of groceries from your wife's boot to the kitchen that's power (laughs) Uh, you know undoing those really difficult um, jars when your wife comes to you, men, and says, I can't do this, can you just undo this? And you, you think, yeah, it's an opportunity for me to prove my manhood. <clears throat> and then you can't, you still can't. So power is the ability to do something that you couldn't do before. Can we agree on that? So in what way does the Holy Spirit give Christians the ability to do something they couldn't do before? We've seen one already, their bravery, didn't, didn't have before. What else? Well, bravery, witness, yeah. Any others you can think of? Again, bravery, witness, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty powerful. You, can't, you don't just do that when you feel like it. So the Holy Spirit empowered the early uh, apostles, mainly, to do miracles, Okay. What else? What other kind of power does the Holy Spirit? Maybe to ordinary Christians. Yeah, a gift to the Holy Spirit. Why does he empower Christians with the gift of the Holy Spirit? Let's turn, actually, and let the Bible answer that question. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Can someone just read that out when you have it? Thank you. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then Paul goes on to list some of the gifts of the Spirit. And we've got a few places in the New Testament where we read of these lists of gifts. They're not um, all the same. Uh, So there's a lot of gifts. And I I think there's more gifts than just those listed in in the New Testament. They're not exhaustive. But there's gifts. And what that means is that Christians are able to do things that they couldn't do before they were Christians. That the Holy Spirit enables them to do for the common good. And you can read a lot about that, for example, in 1 Corinthians. Do we see this in the Old Testament? Do we see the Holy Spirit empowering people for the common good? Where? We do, but where? Solomon, exactly. Empowered with wisdom. Okay. Where else do we see people empowered in the Old Testament? Samson was. The prophets were. 
A lot of the judges, other than Samson, were? You, you are? He was a prophet? So we see, and also, Bezalel. <laughs> you know, everybody underestimates Bezalel. He's just a name, and you pass through him. But he's the guy who decorated the temple. And he needed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. So God wanted the temple decorated and the murals so beautiful that only someone empowered by the Holy Spirit could, could do that. Imagine what they would have looked like. Eh? Yeah? And so what we see is whenever God wants people... Can someone keep the kids quiet, please? Sorry. I don't know why they're out of the room. <laughs> yeah. That'll work. <laughs> okay. Whenever we see God doing His kingdom work through people, He empowers them with the Holy Spirit to do it. In the Old Testament, Bezalel, the judges, whenever God was doing something and, and forwarding His agenda, He was empowering people with the Holy Spirit on the way. But then comes Acts, just like God promised, He's going to empower everyone. So the kingdom work that's able to be done is going to be exponentially increased because now everyone will have the same power as Bezalel and um, Solomon and all the rest of them had. It's quite, a, it's quite a thing to think about, isn't it? That you and I, just being Christians, have, that, have access to that same power to do God's work on earth. So let that sink in for a second. Okay, let's go back to Acts and Luke. What else do we learn about the Holy Spirit? We've learned that He was promised and, and chasing that up, we learned that uh, the thing that the Holy Spirit was going to do was going to be continuing to do his creative work and undoing the curse. We read that he empowers people in that, uh, and the reason why he empowers people is to do the work of that undoing of the curse. Um, what else does he do? What else do we learn about him? In Acts. So we've, we've exhausted the Luke passage. So just look at the Acts one for now. Anything else we learn about the Holy Spirit from there? There's one that's a little easy to miss. Where's the first time we read the Holy Spirit mentioned? Verse 2. What does it say about the Holy Spirit in verse 2? What? Okay, you have all read that? He's given instructions. I'll just read the whole verse. Until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. What does that mean? What, is, what does it mean that, God, that Jesus was giving instructions to his apostles through the Holy Spirit? Why, did he, why couldn't he just give them instructions by himself? Why was he doing it through the Holy Spirit? Any ideas? He was preparing them. But why, did he, why couldn't he just prepare them by himself? He's Jesus. Why did he give them instructions through the Holy Spirit? Why did the, why did the Holy Spirit have to come and play a role? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what will he do then because you're right and it's exactly what Jesus promised in John he said I'm going to and at the end of John he breathes on them okay and that, that breath the Greek word is pneuma so we get the word pneumatic from uh, or um, what's the disease uh, pneumonia thank you Okay, pneuma, it's from the Greek word spirit or breath. It's the same word. And when he breathed on them, he was, that was uh, essentially him showing that he was transferring the spirit from him to them. But in John, he promised that when they get the spirit, the spirit will enable them to do something. Let's turn and see quickly. Uh, John 15. I know this is hard work, but walk with me on this. And um, before the end of our session, we're going to start applying all of these truths we learn about the Holy Spirit now to our lives. But John 15. Um, 
Somebody read verse 26 for us. John 15, 26. Okay. So when the spirit of truth, what will the spirit of truth do? Yeah. And who will he testify to? Yeah. And the apostles themselves, remember. So read down, uh, carry on in that passage. Look at verse... 13, I'll read that for us. 13 to 15. When the Spirit of Truth comes, interesting, he calls him the Spirit of Truth, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. And so why did Jesus, when he instructed his apostles, need to instruct them through the Holy Spirit? Of course. But here we see that the Holy Spirit is essential to guide us into truth, not just Jesus. Now, this is the reason why, because that's what we learned from John, that Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit to guide his people into all truth. It goes on. I'll just read it. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. I think that's going to unlock this idea for us. Look at that. Verse 14. He will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus instructed his, his disciples. And that came from his mouth into their heads. But then the Holy Spirit made it make sense in their heads. And he turned the objective truth that Jesus was telling them to subjective truth that they believed. Because here's the thing. We need a supernatural enabling to believe what Jesus is saying and to believe the gospel and the disciples did as well they couldn't just hear Jesus and go you know what I what Jesus said makes a lot of sense because of my Jewish training and I've worked it out and yeah it it all fits together and I'm going to believe it because of that they didn't decide to believe the Holy Spirit caused them to believe the Holy Spirit was taking the words of Jesus and making them do something in the minds of the disciples and the hearts of the disciples and that's what the Holy Spirit does he makes the words of Jesus work and bear fruit and have real effects. He makes the objective truth of the gospel subjectively true in the hearts of people. Does that make sense? And I think that is a very important thing to realize about the Holy Spirit because it's very easy for us to get discouraged when we share the objective truths of the gospel with someone. And in the back of my mind, we're going, you know, this, this sounds ridiculous to them. <laughs> Don't we do that? We share with our friends and we go, you know, well, Jesus, he, he died for the sins of the world and he rose again. And as we're saying it, we're going, wow, this must sound so bizarre to the person. And it does. They need supernatural help to believers. But that's the thing. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to do. And that's what he's in believers to do. To make the, what sounds bizarre coming out of your mouth actually make sense in the mind of the other person when he opens their eyes which ties into what we were talking about earlier about the opening eye role of the Holy Spirit any questions or comments on that that's good point yeah Yeah. Yeah. It's only through the Holy Spirit that they are able to obey or empowered to obey or given even the motivation to obey. And it's only through the Holy Spirit that they will believe. 1 Corinthians 12.3. I'll just read it. We don't have time all to turn there. But it says this. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Think about that. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. 
No one can work out and believe that Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit causes them to. And that's why Jesus, when he instructed his disciples, needed to do it through the Spirit. Because they were not going to believe this stuff unless the Holy Spirit causes them to. And neither are your friends or family going to believe anything you say unless the Holy Spirit causes them to. And neither could you believe unless the Holy Spirit causes you to. Which means, what proof is there in your life that the Holy Spirit is present? Fruit is some proof. I mean, if you had to look for the last few days at how patient have you been in the last few days. Sometimes it's, it's quite difficult to find the fruit of the Spirit. And that we'll get to in a bit is because we're not always filled with the Spirit. But there is one proof, which is that we believe that Jesus is Lord. Because if it's true that you can't say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, and you truly believe Jesus is Lord, that's proof that you have the Holy Spirit. Even if you're not filled with Him, and even if you're not um, living the best, kind of most Spirit-filled life, you can still know you have the Spirit purely because you believe. You would not be able to believe if you didn't have the Spirit in you. <laughs> That's just because I... It's just because for the first time in six months I can see you. <laughs> okay. But I want that to sink in. I'm going to say it again. I know it's, it's bad to repeat myself over and over again, but this is so important. If you believe Jesus is Lord, it's because the Holy Spirit has caused you to believe that, which means that alone is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a great assurance? If someone comes to you and says, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not sure if I have the Holy Spirit, what can you say to them to assure them that they do? Do you believe Jesus is Lord? Yes, I do. Well, then you have the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Any questions on that? Okay, we've got to move on quickly, unfortunately. Um, now let's go to... Now we're going to go to a few... We've, we've kind of mined those verses for what we can learn about the Holy Spirit. That he's the, he, he's the instructor. He's the one God promised. He's the one who gives new life. He's the one who empowers God's people to do God's work on earth. There's one that we, we could have got as well, which is he must be received. Jesus says, wait until you receive him. He's a spirit which people don't have automatically in them. He must be received. But now turn with me. This is what I mentioned in the sermon, but it's a real important verse to Galatians chapter 3. Turn with me to Galatians 3. And what we're going to do now is we're going to read a few New Testament references about the Spirit, wrap up this lesson on the Spirit, and then start to apply it to our lives. And we'll finish not on the dot half past, a little bit after that. Apologies for that. Uh, we started a bit late getting everything set up. But let's read Galatians 3. Can someone read verse 13 to 14 for us? We're going to go quite fast now. Okay, now this is actually an amazing verse because it tells us the whole purpose of the gospel. It tells us the purpose that Jesus died for sins. What was that purpose? Well, there's a bit of a chain of, of causes here. Verse, you can't just throw out theological words. It's got to make sense and it's got to be from the text. Okay, Christ redeemed us by the curse of the Lord by becoming a curse for us. He died on the cross. Why? Verse 14. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. And that's where covenant comes in. Thank you. So that we might receive. So what's God's end goal in all of this? Like all this, this covenant stuff, the sending Jesus to die, all of that. God's end goal, the purpose he did all of it was so that we could receive His Spirit in us. Okay, now if that doesn't hit you, then you need to read it again until it does. <laughs> Everything we celebrate and sing about and study in the Bible and the covenant and the Old Testament and the gospel and all of that 
God did so that you could receive His Spirit in you. That's His end goal. (laughs) So that the Spirit in you and in the church can eventually bring about the promise of the new creation and the reversal of blessing. And He starts now by slowly but surely reversing the no, reversal of curse. Not reversal of blessing, reversal of curse. And He starts now by reversing the curse in your life, bit by bit, slowly but surely, to make you a new creation being. And that's God's whole plan. That's God's goal. If you don't receive the Spirit, the Gospel was for nothing. And the covenant is for nothing, according to Galatians 3. Okay, so... Now, this is, this is important because that means that accepting Jesus for our sins is not just so we can go to heaven when we die or not just so we can not go to hell, which are good reasons to accept Jesus. But the main reason God wants, us, God wants people to accept Jesus is so they can receive His Spirit. Let's turn a page over to Galatians 5. Verse 16. Someone read that for us. Galatians 5.16. Okay, some simple questions. What does Paul tell Christians to do? Live by the Spirit. What does that imply that Christians are able not to do? Yeah, he wouldn't have told us to live by the Spirit if we automatically lived by the Spirit. Now this is where it starts to get interesting. Because God's whole purpose of all of this is to give us the Spirit... But now we have to actually make sure we live by the Spirit. It doesn't happen automatically. Okay? Um, Let's read on from verse 17. For the flesh uh, desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. But, notice the but there. But if you are led by the Spirit. It's not automatic that you're going to be led by the Spirit because you've got your flesh as well trying to lead you. Now, the works from verse 19. The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. What are these? They're old creation curse ways of living right it's what our flesh wants to do when you're envious that's from the curse that's a curse bit of you that's an old creation way of living you won't be envious in the new creation when you have jealousy when there's strife when there's anger when there's selfish ambition let's be honest we all have these that's part of our old cursed flesh but let's read on I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are new creation personalities. the new creation ways of living. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, you would think, just by reading that, that if we have any of these old things, envy, strife then surely we can't have the spirit because apparently the spirit um, crucifies these things but then paul goes on to say if we live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another envying one another so he's saying it's perfectly possible for christians to keep doing these things and it's your it's up to you to make sure that you live by the spirit this new creation life rather than live by the flesh Okay, especially in our relationships with each other. That's where you can see most of all whether you're living a new creation life or an old creation life. It's very interesting, these lists that Paul gives all refer to relationships with people. Kindness. You can't be kind by yourself, right? It implies that you're kind to someone else. There's a subject of your kindness. Gentleness, self-control, peace. Of course, you can be at peace by yourself, but try to be at peace with another human being. That's where it gets difficult. Envy, uh, dissensions, factions, anger. These are all things that are messed up relationships. And so the Holy Spirit, this new creation living, is seen in our relationships with other people. Okay. 
So if we walk by the Spirit, our lives more and more will display new creation living in our relationships, not old creation living. Um, just a couple more things to, to go through before we wrap up. Ephesians 5. I like this one. This will um, give us a little bit of a thought break. This is a key one. You should know it. But I'll read it again in its context. Ephesians 5 from verse 15 to 21. Actually, can someone else read that for me? Um, who, wants, who wants to read? Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. Anyone? Nikhil, thanks. Okay, so here we see, this is kind of Isaiah 32, what the Holy Spirit does to the earth eventually in the new creation, turning it from barrenness and brokenness to flourishing and blessing. Here we see Him doing that in individual Christian lives, turning your barrenness and brokenness in your relationships to flourishing and blessing. That, that's what this is saying. But to, to what does Paul compare being filled with the Spirit? What illustration does he use? being drunk right <laughs> now why in what way is being filled with the spirit similar to being drunk now the pentecostals will stand up and say oh it's because you laugh and lose control of yourself but that's not true um but what is similar between being drunk with wine and being filled with the spirit yeah maybe <laughs> okay So when it comes to kingdom work, there is a sense of that, that the, witness, the witnesses of Christ were happy to, to open up and talk about the gospel. They didn't have the inhibitions of worrying whether they, they were going to be persecuted because they didn't care anymore. Ravi, you wanted to say something? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, more and more, yeah. But look what Paul says here in verse 18. He tells you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which means that you're not automatically filled with the Spirit. If Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have needed to tell you to be filled with the Spirit. And if you are filled with the Spirit, more and more, you'll see the fruit of the Spirit in your life, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so here, here is what it is. Thank you, because that's brilliant. It, drink changes your personality, doesn't it? You drink, you have a bit too much wine, suddenly you're a new person, or you're the old person rearing its ugly head. Sorry? Because <laughs> I've observed it, of course. But now here's the thing. Okay, if what Paul says is right, that we have the, the spirit in us, but we've also got the flesh in us, then there's two ways of unlocking either of those things. You want to unlock the flesh? Drink. And you can see it. You drink and suddenly the flesh has a field day. The flesh is out and he's partying and he's abusing people and he's being nasty and he's getting into an argument with your wife. If you, if you drink too much, the, the flesh is going to do his thing. And all creation living is going to come out of you. If, you have the, if you're filled with the Spirit, opposite. Filled with the Spirit, new creation life is going to come out of you. This love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And so in the same way as drink unlocks the old creation life in you, the Spirit unlocks the new creation life in you and changes your personality for the good like drink changes it for the bad. Yeah. And that's why Paul says, don't get drunk on wine. You can't open that door for the flesh and then also be filled with the Spirit. You've got to choose which, which one you're going to let out. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Final, final verse we're going to go to, and then we're going to wrap up. Luke 11. Um, this is important because now we're going to get into the application of all this. Luke 11. I'm going to read 11 to 13. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the stuff you want to those who ask him? Oh wait, that's not what it says. Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. You know, we, we're very interested in prayer as long as God gives us the stuff we ask for here. Jesus says God's definitely going to give, when you ask, the Holy Spirit to you. Okay, so now we start to answer the question, how do we be filled with the Holy Spirit if that's what we need to do? And it's very simple. You know, there's no, you don't have to be a genius to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you don't have to be super spiritual and know the depths of Scripture and go on courses to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What have you got to do? got to ask it's as simple as that that's really how simple it is and also we've got to realize that it's good for us to have the holy spirit that's the point of what jesus is saying here why does the father give an egg rather than a scorpion to his son if the son asked for a scorpion do you think the father would give it to him probably not if he asks for an egg The father will give it to him. Why? Because it's nourishing, because it's good for him. Of course, if if you're a father or a mother, you know that you're happy to give. If your kids come to you and say, can I have some broccoli with more broccoli with my food? Of course, you'll give it to them because you know it's good for them. If they say, can I have more sweets on my ice cream? Then you're going to go, no, you can't have too much. But you're happy to give them when they recognize what the right things are to ask for, the good things to ask for, you're happy as as the Father to give it to them. In the same way, when we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the thing we should ask for more than anything else, and we ask for it, God says, finally you've realized why I sent Jesus and why I've done all this, and that's what I want you to be asking for. Of course I'll give it to you. Okay. And that's the assurance we have. If we want the Holy Spirit... And we ask for the Holy Spirit, God promises He will give us the Holy Spirit and fill us with the Holy Spirit. But why, if it's so easy to be filled with the Spirit, why so often are we not in that case? Why so often does this old creation life still come out and this new creation life doesn't? Why are we so often not filled with the Spirit? Why does Paul have to keep telling us to be filled with the Spirit if it's so easy? because we don't ask (laughs) why don't we ask what are some of the things that prevent us from genuinely asking to be filled with the spirit we yeah i love that we think we're fine we think we're good without the holy spirit or we've got enough holy spirit thanks okay Anything else? Anything else that prevents us from actually genuinely asking to be filled with the Spirit? Because if it's that simple, why don't we do it? What prevents us from asking? Hmm? Now, why does the self not want you to ask for the Holy Spirit? Yeah, but why does the Robbie, why does Robbie in you not want you to ask for the Holy Spirit? Well, it, I'll tell you why. It's because the Robbie in you wants control. He doesn't want someone else to come in and, and clean house and take over. And it's, it's not just Robbie, by the way. It's all of us. It's the Nick inside me. It's the Alan inside Alan. It's the Rowan inside Rowan. It's, we want control of our lives. And the Holy Spirit is going... We have to relinquish control if we want the Holy Spirit to come and take over and and bring out this new creation life we actually have to hand control of our lives to him 
And that's something that actually prevents us from genuinely asking. We, you know, we, we're happy to receive the fruit of the Spirit as long as we don't have to give up control of our lives. But also, Rowan, that was actually a brilliant observation that sometimes we think we, we're fine without the Holy Spirit. And how foolish. And yet we do, don't we? Why do we think we're fine? Mm. The world tells us we're fine. Yeah. The world tells us, you yeah, know, what's a little bit of sin? That's actually quite fun. So you don't need to change. Yeah, that actually, that's what the world tells you. You don't need to change. You're fine by yourself. The movies tell us, music tells us, everything. That's the big message of the world. If you, if you're, if you, you're a boy, but you think you're a girl, you don't need to change. You're fine. Embrace that. Embrace your sin. That's what the world tells you to do. What does the Bible tell you to do? One thing you need to do is change because you're, you're a sinner. <laughs> and so if you had to summarize what the, the flesh tells you, the flesh tells you stay the same. The spirit tells you you've got to change. Which of those is easier? To stay the same. And so we're much more likely to not ask for the spirit because we know that's going to cause uncomfortable change in our lives. It's going to cause us to realize parts of our lives we, we need to address. It's going to cause us to change our habits. Whereas not asking the Spirit is much easier because we don't have to change. And if we think we're okay without changing, then we won't ask. Okay. Um, it's quarter two. We're going to have to wrap up now. One other thing I just want to mention, I did in my sermon, so I won't take long, is that the Word is the way the Holy Spirit does His changing work in us. In Ephesians uh, 6, the Word is called the sword of the Spirit. And so the best way to let the Holy Spirit do His work is to open His Word that He inspired and that He works through and that He doesn't work apart from. We're going to talk about that more on Sunday morning anyway. Um, and so the reason we do this shouldn't be to increase our knowledge. I wonder why you came here tonight. Um, did you come here because you want to know the Bible more so you can, ask, you can answer people's questions better? Did you come here so you can know the Bible more so you can have a more together life? Or did you come here so that you can be filled more with the Spirit? Because that's the right reason. <laughs> and yet, is that the reason we come and listen to sermons and take every opportunity we can to study the Bible? If this is the sword of the Spirit, we've got to see this as a means to the end of what God wants for us, which is to be filled with the Spirit. Um, how can we, uh, sorry, I've got to um, cut in and just ask the last question. How can we help each other to be filled with the Spirit? How does that help us to be filled with the Spirit? Okay, we encourage each other. Confess to each other. We can pray for each other. If asking is the means by, of receiving the Spirit, we can pray for each other. Well, how else can we help each other to be filled with the Spirit? Hmm? How's loving each other going to help us to be filled with the Spirit? Love is a result of being filled with the Spirit, not the means to be filled with the Spirit. Sharing the Word. If the Word is the sword of the Spirit... You can help your Christian brother or sister to be filled with the Spirit by opening the Word. Every time you open the Word, the Spirit's going to do His work. When you meet for coffee, rather than just catch up and talk about how your week was, spend time in the Word together. Because that's helping the other person to be filled with the Spirit again. And there's many other ways. But we have a responsibility not only to ask that we are filled with the Spirit and remove all the reasons we don't want to be, but also to help each other to be filled with the Spirit. And imagine what we can do when we are. <laughs> um, but more on that this Sunday. Let's spend some time praying. Uh, sorry, we've run over time. I haven't led a Bible study like this for a long time, so you'll forgive me. Um, but let's spend the last few minutes together praying. Anybody can pray based on what we've read and then um, Dylan would you close for us thanks let's pray